most of us believe certain things, especially in regard to, uh, I think, this kind of a subject, the rapture of the church. There are some topics that are, that are picked up over our being in church and listening to things, in, whether it's messages in the church or online, we pick up a, a belief system, a doctrine, and it's, and it's, and it, it is expressed through a phrase, pre-tribulation rapture, right? And that's very common. And I was taught that many over the years of my, you know, walking with the Lord. And it, the, the only reason I believe that is because somebody else told me that was the case, right? They told me that was the case. And I said, okay, these were, uh, you know, well-known people, uh, pastors, and then people I had listened to in other places. Uh, it, but then I, in, in continuing study, I said, well, the question was, is that true? Uh, is the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, is that actually true? Or do I just believe it because other people have told me that's true? So that began the, the search uh, and the, uh, the study of the end times. And I have uh, come to a, an understanding, and I think it's a very accurate understanding of that subject. When, when does the rapture take place? And I want to address that today because to me it's very comprehensive, it's very clear, and it, is, uh, uh, it can be controversial because it's not pre-tribulation. When you say pre-tribulation, that even has doctrine in it. Uh, before the tribulation. And, and the question is, wh what is the tribulation? What is the tribulation? What, what actually is that? And they would say, well, that's the, the, la the last seven years. That's the tribulation. And that is wrong doctrine because in the Bible, it, the last seven years are never called the tribulation years. It's not called. So even in that phrase, pre-tribulation, there's error because it is, not, it is not known, the last seven years are not known as the tribulation. So uh, that's, that's my goal this morning. Hopefully we'll have an adequate time here and we can move through it pretty quickly. So, and this is not only for that friend and for you guys, but I also want this to be out on the internet as for people to listen to and to, uh, uh, and to assess the, the doctrinal uh, clarity of it. And I think there is doctrinal clarity to it. And these are some of these subjects, they're not, it's not a matter of, of salvation. You know, a person can be saved and be pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, uh, that's not going to affect their their standing with the Lord. But I do think it's important because uh, it impacts on how we how we live through these these final years, and when the when those last seven years on when we're approaching them, if we have wrong doctrine, it may dramatically affect our our preparation and. Uh, Our, I'll just say our preparation, because it's probably more than that. So that, that's why it's important to me. So, so let's pray. Let me pray, and, and uh, we'll go from there. Father, we just pray, Holy Spirit, to give divine direction and understanding and clarity in this message this morning. We just bind every power of the enemy that would intrude or, or have any effect on this message today. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, this morning we're going to be talking about the end times, primarily the last, the last seven years that are ahead of us. Most, and I, and I agree with this, we are not in the last seven years. We are approaching those last seven years of, of history. And there is, uh, to give it a term, what are those last seven years called? It, they are not called the tribulation, it's not called the tribulation or the tribulation years in the Bible. The, the, the correct term is Daniel's 70th week. Daniel's 70th week. That's the proper term for those last seven years. Daniel's 70th week. And, and in, it, within that, there is something called the, uh, the, the rapture of the church. That word rapture is not used actually in the Bible, but it's, it's just a term that's used for uh, rapturous, to being caught up. And that term is used in the Bible, to be caught up, to, to be gathered together unto him. 
uh, and it's, it's a wonderful event, and it's one that, we, uh, that people are looking forward to. The question is, is when does that occur? So is there going to be a, a rapture? Let me give you, I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures. We're just going to read them, brief comments. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, remember that term keeps coming up, the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. That is rapturous, they'll be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. He's coming with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. That's the sh one shouting. And with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, rapture, then we shall, that are alive and remain, shall be caught up, rapture, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we're going to meet him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with those words. So there, this is, this is, it's, it's a, a clear doctrine that there will be a catching away, a gathering together of the Lord in the clouds, in the air. Uh, at, at a trump and at the sh and a shout. Matthew 24, 31 says this, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet. Jesus was teaching on this in Matthew 24, his great message on the end times. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. All right, so that, that's, a, that's pretty clear that there is going to be an event in time where the dead in Christ rise first, and then those who are alive together uh, and remain, they'll, they'll be changed in a, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, caught up into the, into the clouds. So now, wh what are those, those last seven years, what are we, what's the term that we use? Well, it's Daniel's 70th week. And we find that from the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 25 to 27. Now, therefore, understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem... Now, that was a command given by a, guy, a, a, a king of Babylon called Artaxerxes. From that moment, from when he gave that command, unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks. Now, let's watch. Seven weeks, then three score, which is 60, and two weeks. So seven and 60 and two are 69 weeks. It goes on to say, and the streets shall be rebuilt again, and the wall, even in troubled times, uh, building of Jerusalem. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So the first seven weeks of years, right? So that when they say a week, it's seven years, right? So there's 70 weeks, 70 weeks of years. The first seven or 49 weeks were back in the time of Ezra and the Zerubbabel and, uh, and Nehemiah who were rebuilding Jerusalem. That was 49 years. And then there was a moment where, from that moment, there were 62 more years of weeks, or 62 weeks of years, until Messiah would be cut off. So that's a total of 69 weeks. 69 weeks is 483 years, right? If you do the math, it's 483 years from the time that Artaxerxes made, gave the command to go and rebuild Jerusalem were 69 years. That uh, uh, 69 weeks of years, which is 483 years. And, if, and if, when you, if you look at the calendar, from that time to when, when Jesus goes down into Jerusalem and is crucified, is it exactly 483 years from Artaxerxes' command to restore Jerusalem. Right? So it's exact. Daniel's message, Daniel's prophecies are so accurate. There are those who wonder whether that was even written many, many years later when they actually the events had taken place because it was so accurate. And then it goes on to say, and this is verse 27, and, and then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, a one week of years. So there's going to be a covenant that's going to be confirmed by this Antichrist figure at the very beginning of those last seven years. It says... That Antichrist, he's going to confirm the covenant. It doesn't say he's necessarily going to sign it, but he's going to confirm it. This begins the seven-year countdown. You say, well, when does that, when do the seven years actually begin? A lot of people say, when does that begin? There's going to be a peace covenant between Israel and the surrounding nations. They call them the ring of fire right now. And that, 
in Psalm 83, there's that Psalm 83 war with all the nations that are mentioned there. They, they are the same as the ring of fire. So there is going to be, and, and we're obviously we're in this war right now at the culmination of this potentially, and this is what we're looking for, that there is going to be a peace agreement between these nations, but the guy is going to confirm it. He's going to be the Antichrist, but he's not going to be known as the Antichrist. He's not revealed until later. They don't know it's him, but he, is, he has arisen to a place of prominence, and he's going to confirm that covenant. That's also the first seal in the book of, uh, in Revelation 6, there are, there are, you know, seven seals. The first seal is the emergence of this Antichrist figure, but he's not known as an Antichrist. He, he's not known as that until much later, but he's a prominent political figure that orchestrates this peace agreement. At that moment, this part of that agreement is going to be the building of the third temple. That's going to be underway uh, uh, during those, the first part of this seven-year period. Okay? But in the midst of the week, this out of Daniel, after three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifice to cease. And for the over, this is complicated language, but you know what it is. The overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate abomination of desolation uh, for the overspread shall make it even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate in other words the abomination of desolation complicated language seven years it begins with the confirmation of this covenant this is Daniel's now his 70th week and it and it and it begins those last seven years when that covenant is affirmed among the nations and then it's then it begins Jesus teaches also about this abomination of desolation, which is in the middle of those last seven years. Okay? That's what Daniel's in seven years, in the midst of the week, three, three and a half years, this, the sacrifice is stopped. What sacrifice? Well, it will be the sacrifice that's re in, in, uh, begun again by the Jewish people because they will have the temple back. There can be no system of sacrifice unless there's a temple. It's required. We all are probably aware of the, uh, the red heifers that have come from Texas and they've been sent over to Jerusalem uh, for the initial sacrifice that can, that can begin the sacrificial system. In the book of Leviticus, that, that is part of the required ceremony. The location of the red heifer, that's an absolutely perfect red heifer. It can have one white hair. And they, that uh, was, is sacrificed, it's burned, and the ashes are put in the water, and the water is put on the, the, the altar, and then we have the beginning of the sacrificial system. Those, those animals are now in Israel. They've already reestablished the Sanhedrin, the, or the uh, uh, temple priesthood. They have a lot of the furniture redone, so they're pre preparing for this, the third temple to be built. It will not be built until this covenant is reestablished. Antichrist is going to be a part of that, this political leader. We don't know who it is, but he's in all likelihood alive. Israel is now a nation. That started the end time clock. That was 1948. That's, that began the, the process and is one of the most uh, astounding events that's taken place in, in, in the world when a whole nation that's been spread over the whole globe comes back together into its land. And now we see the, uh, all of the uh, uh, violence that's taking place and the war that's underway there. So we know there's, this is a spiritual conflict because God is moving, moving mightily, by the way, in Israel with souls being saved. At the, end, at the culmination of that war, when peace comes, if there's a peace agreement among those nations and they give permission for that temple to be rebuilt, you know then you're in the end times. That's when the end time begins. If someone would say, well, we're in the last seven years. No, no we can't be because there's, there's, no, uh, there's no peace agreement uh, uh, that's been established. So for three and a half years, this Antichrist figure is developing. He's becoming more prominent. Uh, he's ha having greater control globally until the, the middle of that week, there is, a, a, the, the, what we call the revealing of the Antichrist. He shows his hand, so to speak. 
and he goes to the temple and he declares himself to be God and Daniel says he, he causes the sacrifice to cease. He stops the sacrificial system and he goes into, the, into that rebuilt temple and declares himself to be God. I think a better way to understand that he declares himself to be Messiah. He declares himself to be the, the anointed one because he is the counterfeit to the Son of God. We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the counterfeit to that is Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. That's the counterfeit. So he is a counterfeit of the Son of God, Antichrist. Anti meaning two things, in place of, and, and also in opposition to. When you say an, an, he's Antichrist, he's in opposition to, and he's also in replacement of. It's interesting that the term Antichrist is not even used in the book of Revelation. He is known as the beast. The beast of Revelation, that is the Antichrist. First John talks about the spirit of Antichrist in his writings, but he's really not called that in those, in those letters. Uh, regardless, it's the same individual. So, now Jesus in Matthew 24, it's very interesting because there's, there's two comparative passages. One is Matthew 24 and the other is Revelation 6 and 7. Right, now here's where we say we develop the evidence uh, regarding the, when, when did the Antichrist actually uh, emerge? When does he come up? And Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 and 7 are parallel. What Jesus teaches you find in, in Revelation 6 and 7. Many people are, are unaware of that. And here's a portion of what Jesus teaches about the abomination of desolation. And this is about in the middle of that chapter, Matthew 24, 15 to 22. And you shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So Jesus is quoting Daniel from the Old Testament, who uh, stand in the holy place. That's when he goes to the, to the temple. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains, let him which is the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house, and neither let him which is in the field turn back to take his clothes. And woe to them which are with child, and to them that are breastfeeding in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath. For then shall great tribulation, uh, such as has not been since the beginning of the world, to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days shall be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, that's the, the, the believers, those days shall be shortened. All right, there's several things here. No, number one, he's talking about this event in the middle of the seven years, the abomination of desolation. This is after the first, second, third, and fourth seal is opened. I'm going to try to tie this together. First, second, and fourth seal. The fifth seal is martyrs, and that's right in the middle. What happens then is, the, is this Antichrist, this beast, declares himself to be Messiah, goes to the temple and says, I am now, I am the Messiah. And the people are deceived and accept, and accept, some people accept it. But in a moment of time, he turns on the elect, he turns on, on the Jewish people. And that's who he's relating to here, the Jewish people. But the elect are, as a broader term, for all of God's people are called the elect. He immediately goes after them and begins a, 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 a slaughter that makes the Holocaust look like, you know, kindergarten work. He said, don't even wait. There's, there's a, an incredible, say, persecution, but the, the, the number of martyrs is, is significant. And then you see that in, in that, the, the, uh, the fifth seal, the martyrs of the church. That's, that's right in the middle. And he said, this is called the Great Tribulation. The great tribulation, which immediately follows, watch it now, the abomination of desolation. Now, I want to show you that there are, dividing up the last, these last seven years, we can divide them up in two ways. I picture, get the chart in your mind. One way to divide it up is uh, sevens. There are seven seals, there are seven trumpets, and there are seven bowls, all right? Seven seals, there's a scroll. It's a scroll that, that John is seeing, and it's, it has seven seals on it, and one by one they're being removed. And you can read about those in uh, both Matthew 24 and Revelation 6, because they are parallel passages. 
and each one of them opens. The first one is the emergence of the Antichrist. He's not known to be it, but he comes. Then there's wars and rumors of wars. There's plagues. There's, uh, uh, there's famine. There's earthquakes. These, those events are events in the natural realm, and it is man persecuting man, right, up through the Antichrist. It's not, God is not involved, with, there's no wrath of God here. It's man, it's natural events that you would, you know, it's like a hurricane. That's, well, there's hurricanes, there's earthquakes, there's volcanoes, there's all these things, there's always been. They are happening sequentially in a very dramatic pattern, right, they're happening. And then we have the Antichrist, the beast coming and persecuting the church, right? That's all man or natural events. Here's, a, here's the big mistake that many of the, those who study this make, and I don't know why they do. They will designate the beginning of this seven years as tribulation. They'll say this is the tribulation, and that's the error. That, this is the difficult times, but it's not the tribulation. Jesus calls the first half of this seven years, he calls it the beginning of sorrows, right? That's the first section. The first half is the beginning of sorrows. The next event is, if you want to put it, make another chart. The next event is the abomination of desolation followed by the great tribulation. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. For then shall be great tribulation, right? That's the only tribulation is only used in those last seven years as great tribulation. That comes after the, the middle of that seven years, when the, in the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist goes to the temple and he reveals himself, okay? The next section, that's the Great Tribulation, followed by, now, and we would say this is, all the seals are being removed until the seventh seal, a sixth seal is removed. It's not open yet, it's got a scroll. Then the seventh seal is open and the scroll is now opened. And heaven somehow can see this scroll. It's what's written on the inside. What's written on the inside is all the information about the trumpets and the bowls. That's what's in that, on that scroll. Everything was just, these are opening one after another. Who can, and it says, who can open the, John says, who can open these seals? Is it only the Lamb of God, the one that's sitting on the throne? So they are all open until the last one. The fifth one is the... Uh, is, are the martyrs, and that's the abomination of desolation. Immediately after that are the celestial signs, where the sun turns dark, the moon turns to blood, there's a, me a meteorite shower, it says the stars are falling from heaven. What is it that's, the question is, what is it that stops this great tribulation? He said, since the beginning of the world to this time, there's never, ever been anything like this tribulation. This, it's a great tribulation. There's martyrdom. People are being slaughtered. People, heads are cut off. He, the Antichrist is filled with the, the, uh, the venom, the, the rage of, of, of uh, hell. And uh, you can see that in some people on the earth right now in, in these wars and people in the Middle East, they'll cut your head off. Th this is, this is beyond, even beyond that. What is it that stops that? Because he says, no, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, he is going to shorten those days. How is he going to shorten them? And there's two ways. Number one is when those celestial signs take place, when the sun goes dark, how many know that's going to get everybody's attention? And the moon turns to blood, and there's a meteor shower, even though they are in the throes of this attack on God's people, that's going to say, whoa, what is that? What is happening there? And the other is this, is the rapture of the church. That's what's going to end it. He said, except... Uh, except those days be shortened. And we can only say that is going to be, the, the church is going to be raptured. Because they are going to be being persecuted and uh, many are going to be, to be killed. So, here's, the, here's the, another major issue when you study the end time. The question is, when does the wrath of God begin? Major subject. And I was just listening a couple days ago of some very prominent people who are talking about the end times and they have a studio and it's a prophetic thing and the guy wrote a book. And they begin with the, that the beginning of those seven years, they would call that the tribulation years and the day of the Lord or when the wrath of God is being poured out at the beginning. Now that's not true. The wrath of God is not the beginning of this, this first season, which is the beginning of sorrows. That is 
events on the planet. There's wars, there's famines, there's just normal things, but they're intense. And then there's the Antichrist. It's Antichrist persecuting man, but it's God is not, it's not God's wrath. God's wrath is poured out beginning with the trumpets. That's the wrath of God being poured out. And what's interesting with that, you can, you know, use uh, chapter 6 and 7. Chapter 6 are, are all of the, uh, the, the seals being, being taken off the, the scroll. And, at, and then at the sixth seal, opening the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as cloth, and the moon became blood. The stars are falling from heaven. Uh, meteor shower. And then he goes and he said, now for the great, verse 17, for the great day of his wrath is now come, and who shall be able to stand? That's 6 and 17. So the wrath of God does not begin at the beginning of those seven years. And that's an error that's commonly said. It doesn't begin there. And it's obvious in the Bible where it's, it's chapter 6. It's after the sixth seal. And then he says, the day of the Lord's wrath has come. There's a little bit of a, a, a parenthesis there of the 144,000. And then it says this. Okay, we've got the abomination of desolation. All these things, the persecution is coming up. God's wrath is about to come. But it's in verse 9 of chapter 7, it says this. And after this, I, be, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man can number, of all the nations, watch, and all kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. Okay, we've got the sixth seal, and now all of a sudden, there's these people in heaven from all over the planet clothed in white robes. And one of the elders says to him in verse 13 of chapter 7, Who are these which are arrayed in, in robes, and where did they come from? And I said, to, this is, the, this is a, one of the elders uh, asked this question. And I said to him, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So it, this is obvious. This is the rapture clearly spoken in, in verse 9. And then asking the question, he said, these are they which came out of the great tribulation. This is what stops that, what Jesus said, except those days to be shortened, because there's never been anything like that persecution from the beginning of time. He said, except they, those days be shortened. How? Right after the great tribulation, Jesus is talking about it. He said, now the, the, wrath, is, the wrath of God is about ready to be poured out, and, and now these are caught up into heaven. They're right, right after we're right in the middle of this, this uh, abomination of desolation and this great tribulation. The seventh seal is then taken off the scroll and the scroll is opened. And when, verse 1 of chapter 8 of Revelation, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of a half an hour. Now why is that important? And he goes on to say, I saw the angels which stood before, and lo, one of them were given seven trumpets. Within, when they opened those seals, there was the revelation of the end times, and God's wrath is going to be poured out. Chapter 6, the great and day of the wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So God's wrath is the trumpets. And when heaven sees what's in that scroll, apparently heaven sees it, they said, all heaven goes silent. They said, they didn't know it was in the scroll. All of them are being removed to the seventh one. They open the scroll. All heaven goes silent. Say, oh my goodness. God's wrath now, God's vengeance on those that are, have re, re, uh, rejected him, rebelled against him. They have taken on Luciferian traits. They are 100% in with the powers of darkness. And now there is going to be God's judgment on, on those that are, are not redeemed. How, what about this day of the Lord, which is significant? And, and, and let me give you this term. The, the, the term that has become well used is this. What, what about the, the rapture of the church? When does it take place? And it's called pre-wrath rapture. The pre-wrath rapture. It's easy to remember. It's like pre-trib. 
it's pre-wrath because the wrath of God is the trumpets. It comes before that wrath of God, and it must because in First Thessalonians five, whatever, it says that God's people are not appointed. We're not appointed to wrath, so the church has to be gone before the wrath of God is poured out, and that begins at the first at the first trumpet. Now here. Here's a few scriptures about the day of the Lord's wrath. You'd say, well, what, is, what does the Bible have to say about that? Let me give you some verses. Joel 1.15. Alas, for the day, the day of the Lord is at hand as a day of destruction from the Almighty it shall come. That's God's wrath. Or, or, or the other, the synonym is the day of the Lord. Same thing. The day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath is synonymous. Joel 2 and 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Blow the trumpet. Isaiah 13, 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Going back to Joel 2, 31, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood. There's a prophetic a word about those, those end times, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So even that, Joel is prophesying that. He said, the, the sun and the moon is in darkness. That's the, that's the sixth seal, right? He said, that will happen before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And that happens after that, obviously. And that is when the, when the scroll is open uh, uh, with the seventh seal. In Joel 3.14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of, of decision. All right. All right. So I think we have some timing here. I'm doing my best to, get the, to, make the, to draw the picture. Why is this relevant? Let me answer that question. Because if I have the, the, the doctrine, which is commonly understood pre, pre-wrath, or pre-tribulation. Well, then I think that the wrath of God is poured out at the beginning of the seven years, and I'm not going to be here. If that's the case, I am really not going to be very prepared. That's like somebody say that the, the back in the day, the the enemy is at the gate, and you and everybody and the prophet is saying everything's fine, peace, peace, everything's good. Don't worry about it. They're just at the gate. They're not going to get in. And they go, oh boy, we're going to, we're fine then. We're nothing nothing to look at here. But then they break through the gate. And the people are totally unprepared for the events that are about ready to fall because they don't have their war shoes on. They don't have their armor on. They're, they're totally unprepared for the events that are about to unfold. And they will be victimized by the events of that, of, within that war. So if I have, and I would say, the doctrine of pre-tribulation, no great motivation for me to, to do any preparation because we're, we're going to be out of here. God is, God is, is going to, uh, uh, in one place it says God will cause, uh, uh, about being, escape, you will escape. In other words, escape, what, it, what he's talking about there is not from the beginning. We're going to escape the, the wrath of God. That's what we're going to be, escape the wrath of God. Uh, if I'm not preparing for that, what, what these events are unfolding, and, I'm actually, and we are actually going to be here, uh, I'm going to be at a, a terrible deficit to, to approach those days. And I would look at it this way. If, if, if this is wrong, and it's very hard for this to actually be wrong, doctrinally speaking, that's okay. I'm prepared. I'm prepared for the worst stuff coming. And if, and if the rapture comes before the seven years, and hey, I'm happy with that. And, I'm, uh, and uh, that, that would be fine with me. <clears throat> but God is not going to let me be here just because I, would, I, I believe in, a, 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 let's say, a pre-wrath doctor, we would still be raptured with him. But I would rather be prepared for the eventuality of entering in a time of great difficulty and sorrow than not being prepared. Second Thessalonians <clears throat> 2, and here's probably the, I think, the, the clearest evidence of when the, when the uh, rapture takes place. And it's hard to escape the uh, the clear word of God. Second Timothy 2, verse 1. And we beseech you, brethren, by the coming 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's talking about the coming of the Lord. And listen to this. And our gathering together unto him. That's the rapture. Goes on to say, this is, that's the subject. Right? That's the subject. The gathering together unto him. The coming of the Lord. That you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by a spirit or a word or a letter that's supposed to come from us. <clears throat> that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, imminent. Now here's what the, the pre-tribulation doctrine is this. The Lord could come at any time. Now if you've all heard this, it could come at any time. You've got to be ready because he could come right today and there's, there's nothing to be uh, fulfilled <clears throat> before he comes. There's nothing to be filled. He could come. It's, 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 it's imminent. That's what they were teaching in Thessalonica, that the coming of the Lord was imminent. Could come at any time. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Have a little drink here. <coughs> That's called imminence, right? <coughs> he goes this, let no man deceive you. Now he's in that same subject. He said, for those people who are saying Jesus is coming anymore, he said, don't be deceived by that. That's how I read this. Don't be deceived by any means for that day. What day? The gathering together unto him. That day shall not come except. Now, Paul, Paul has already taught about the coming of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians, chapter, uh, 1 Thessalonians. About the rapture and the trumpet and all of that. Others had come and written letters, not from Paul. He said, they're not correct. The rapture or the gathering together legally cannot happen. Cannot happen. Until two things happen. Number one is this. Except there come a falling away first. Right? The gathering together cannot happen until there's a falling away. The word is apostasy. <clears throat> that, the, that the church un, uh, just <clears throat> falls up. I mean, they're, they're leaving. by they're, And I think we could say <clears throat> there's a lot of apath uh, apostasy happening already. There's a great move of God, but there's an apostasy happening. So I'm listening to one guy, a very prominent Bible teacher. He said, well, that, uh, that word apostasy means gathering together. So he said, actually, that apostasy means the rapture. Now I'm looking. So apostasy means the rapture. And, and I was listening just a, a day ago about this very prominent TV show, Prophecy and the News and all. And the guy, he says the exact same thing. And he does not begin from the beginning of that verse. He comes down and he talks about that falling away being the rapture. I said, well, wait a minute. And I told you I was the one fellow I watched on TV and I wrote him a letter on his email. I said, and he said the same thing. I said, that doesn't make sense if, if you got a little bit of comprehension skills. Because that would say the gathering together unto him, the rapture of the church, doesn't happen until the rapture of the church happens. Now, does that make sense to anybody in here? You understand? He said the, the gathering together cannot happen unless the rapture happens. And yet they will be teaching this area of the Bible in a way that's not rational to the to, to the mind. Two things, the, rap, the apostasy, the falling away of the church, and secondly, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That Antichrist has to be revealed before that gathering together takes place. Well, the question is, when is he revealed? Is he revealed at the beginning? You know, the first horse is the, the, the white horse, and the one he has the sword and the bow and all that. Th that the, is the Antichrist coming on the scene. He's, in, he's working now in the, in the culture. But people don't know him as that. They don't know him as the false messiah. They, that's not been revealed. <clears throat> Let's go on. Verse 4 says, This Antichrist opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or what is worshipped, so that he is God sitting in the temple and showing himself that he is God. See, that's the same language. For <clears throat> Uh, as, uh, as Daniel, same thing. And Matthew 24, 14, he says, he goes there and says, I'm the Messiah. So he's the anti-Messiah. That's what he does. And then it goes on to say, uh, uh, the mystery, verse 7, the mystery of iniquity or lawlessness does already work. Only he which restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be 
revealed. Okay, now wait a minute. He's revealed. Uh, he, he's revealed <clears throat> uh, after he goes and sits in the temple. All right, verse 4 says he opposes and he goes and sits in the temple. Then he is revealed. Not until that time. Not until he goes to the temple. There's no revelation that he's the anti Messiah. And it, go, it talks about he which restrains will restrain until he's taken out of the way. A lot of people said, well, that's the church. Well, it can't be it's the church. That doesn't make sense doctrinally because the church is always referred to as a she, not a he. So it's not he he's gonna, that the church is going to believe. So who, who would it be? Uh, is it going to be uh, the Holy Spirit? Well, potentially, but that, the Holy Spirit's not leaving the earth. Because that was it, when he that, he's, he that restrains until he be taken out of the way, taken out of the way, it can be translated, steps aside. So this Antichrist and all that's going to happen is being restrained on, before he goes to that temple. He's being restrained, Potent, potentially by the Holy Spirit, that would be a he. Or secondly, by the archangel Michael, who is the protector of Israel. He is always throughout the scripture, the archangel Michael protects Israel. And it may refer to him. He's taken, he, he moves aside. And now the Antichrist goes in, the abomination of desolation. He goes after the Jewish people and the church. There's a great uh, martyrdom. There's a, uh, much death and destruction because now he's free to do what he wants to do. But before, and that's the great tribulation. And, be, and they said those days are going to be so terrible that except they be sh shortened, uh, no flesh should, should survive. So it's the rapture and it's the, the sixth seal with the celestial signs in the heaven. And it goes on to say, even him who is, and I'll just add this, after the working of Satan with all power and sign, uh, signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So at this point, those that are left on the planet who are going to come under judgment, God has been patient with them. He's been gracious with them. He's called them over and over and over again, and they've said no. And they're, they're, they've, they've sinned away the hour of grace. And for this cause, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What's the lie? That that Antichrist is actually the Messiah. And he's going to promise them peace or whatever, but, they, but he turns on them that they might be damned who, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So there it is. I, uh, I, my prayer is that there's clarity, that we, that we have the pieces in place. And I think several of these uh, are, are crucial. When, when the wrath of the Lord begins, not at the beginning, it's in the middle. Is this all tribulation? No, it's not all tribulation. Beginning of sorrows, abomination of desolation, great tribulation, judgment. Seals, beginning of sorrows, trumpets, wrath of God, day of the Lord, the bowls, wrath of God. Right? All of that is there. And I think it, incredible clarity that in uh, uh, where it says uh, in Revelation 7, 9, and then there was in heaven all of, this, all of these in white robes from every tribe and kindred and tongue. And said, where did these come from? They came out of the great tribulation. And what's amazing, and I'll, I'll end with this. Matthew 24, it begins at verse 4 with, with Antichrist coming. Verse 2 is the, is the second seal. Wars and rumors of wars. Three and four are in verse seven. And a kingdom against famines, pestilence, earthquakes. Then, then five is the, uh, uh, they, they'll deliver you up and kill you. That's, that's the fifth seal. And then he talks about the great tribulation in verse 21. And then in verse 29, immediately after the, after the tribulation of those days, the sun is going to be darkened. See, he's teaching on the same thing. And then it says in... Uh, <clears throat> The sixth seal, the heaven's going to be shaken. Then there shall appear the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes mourn, and they shall, and they shall see the Son of Man coming. 
in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet. And they shall gather the elect from the four, four corners. See, it's, it's a parallel. Those two are parallel. And, and, and the other is the secret rapture of the church, that everybody's going to be hanging around, and all of a sudden people are going to disappear. And that was, Tim, I think it was Tim LaHaye talked, he had the, the, the Bible series on uh, Left Behind, the Left Behind series, and everybody's just going along, and then they just, poof, they disappear. One is asleep, you know, one is at the mill, and one is taken. Is, no, no, actually, actually the Bible says the Son of Man has come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and, uh, uh, and, and it should appear in the sign of heaven, and everybody's going to see him. See, that's what the Bible says about it. There's no secret appearing or, or disappearing of the saints. And uh, when, you, when you put it all together, Daniel, uh, Matthew 24, Revelation 6, 7, a little bit of 8, it's all a pattern, and it's all quite... I think clear evidence that the Lord is coming back right after, uh, right before the wrath of God and right in the middle of the great tribulation. Amen? Amen. All right. I think that's pretty good. Uh, what I was saying to Kathy, I said, I, I have so much in the computer up here, and I need charts, really, I need charts to do this, and, and lists of things, because there's, it's a very comprehensive subject. So to do it in 45 minutes is a little bit of a stretch, but I pray that you've got the, uh, the basics. And say, well, so, 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 okay, that's fine and nice, what about that, what, what does that mean to me? What does it mean to you? This is a time to get ready. Because in Hebrews 25, uh, Hebrews uh, 12, 25, and 6, and it, it comes out of Hosea, it said, Yet once more will I shake, what, the heavens? I'm shaking the earth, that that which cannot be shaken shall remain. So the point is that our devotion to the Lord, our love for Him, our passion for, for Him, our response to His calling in our life, dedication, so devotion, our love for Him, has to go deeper. Because when these events begin to unfold, if, if whatever our faith is in is going to be, sh is going to be shaken except faith in Christ. So if our, if our faith is in the government, our job, our social security, our whatever, that will be shaken. Everything is going to shake it all. You see, I'm going to find out. It's, it's, it's a bit of a test. I'm going to find out where you're at. And it goes on to say, and we are right now receiving an unshakable kingdom, right now. We're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That kingdom, he is the king, and every kingdom has a, is a king in a domain, right? A kingdom. He is the king, we're his domain, and the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, joy, and power in the Holy Ghost. When I have those things, when I know that I'm righteous through the blood of Jesus, when I'm living righteously, and I have joy and peace knowing that he's watching over me and keeping me, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. First Corinthians 4, 20. I'm walking in the power of the Spirit. When these events take place, I, I know what's going on. And I know he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him. And he'll be with me through that, those difficult times. The other thing I also think about is this. I know I'm keeping you a little bit longer, but it's okay. You think about all the people that have gone through trials and tribulation and persecution in the, in the Christian church historically, going back to the Roman Colosseum in Nero, and after that, Diocles, and all of these persecutions that slaughtered people, hung them on crosses, burned them at the stake, the 15th and 16th century, the great persecution under the Roman system. The Inquisitions, they would inquire, you know, you deny the Lord, are you going to the stake? They said, I'm not denying the Lord. They put them, they burned them to death. I say, oh, okay, all of that has happened. In all of these foreign countries, people are being persecuted. But in America, this is how I process it, in America, our doctrine is, oh, no, not for Americans. We will never have any of those trials because God is going to rescue us so we don't have to have any of that trial, any of those problems, not us because we are, we are Americans. We have a doctrine that will not allow that to happen. And I think that oftentimes is, 
you know, kind of working in the background of our, of our life. And, a lot, I, and I also think this, that that falling away is going to come because there are going to be so many that we've been, we've been told that we're going to escape all of this and all this stuff is coming. I quit because they're not ready. And that may be part of the, or the cause of, that, of, the, of the great falling away. So, Lord, thank you, Lord, for this time, this journey through your word. And you wrote much about these end times from back in Daniel, Joel, Isaiah, and now, look, Jesus taught on it. John the Apostle got this revelation on our Isle of Patmos. And Lord, I believe that this is true because it's biblically accurate. Using all the dynamics and the, the understanding from your word. So Lord, keep us prepared as we go through these, five, these years. If they, we don't know when the when that peace agreement is going to be signed, but it could be with this war going on, it could be a week from now. And we go, oh boy, they're, they're, going to build the, they're going to build the third temple, huh? Well, we're ready. But use us, Lord, to reach the lost now. Here I am, totally, we're available, Lord. To be soul winners. While it's yet day, because the night cometh when no man can work. And I thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Amen.